And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. Funny, I made a joke on Twitter and no one got it and it pissed me off. Okay. Okay. So, you know, when you're online and you see one of those posts where someone, someone's writing about, like, Kurt Cobain, but then they use, like, a picture of Owen Wilson or Billy Ray yeah. Cyrus. You know when people do that? Well, I saw a picture of Meatloaf and whoever the girl that Meatloaf sings with on stage doing Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Which I have always fucking hated. I fucking hate that song. <laughs> um, and the way that Meatloaf looked all sweaty and crazy and hunched down, and he's wearing like a pirate, you know, like one of those ruffled 1970s, yeah, like disco shirts. That that I made one of these posts where it's uh, Meatloaf and whoever the chick is singing "Paradise" by the Dashboard Light. But I put as the descriptor for the picture, Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, is a 1979 musical with music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and book by Hugh Wheeler. It is based on the 1970 play Sweeney Todd by Christopher Bond. And I got so many comments and they were all, wow, that guy looks like me, Oh, my God. Is that is that when you buy meatloaf on Timu? No, it fucking is meatloaf. And that pissed me off so much. But then again, I guess, I guess Paradise by the Dashboard Light is not the sort of thing that this new generation understands. Well, it didn't seem like they understood any of it. Like, they didn't understand that, and they didn't understand Sweeney Todd either. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all ridiculous. Anyway. It's time, buddy! It's time. It's time. My yes. God, it's time. Yes, buddy, my friend. It is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast to 23 skidoo our way into the second half of the show. And it is said second half, wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our hand-picked, hand-crafted, and hand job movie of the week. And this week we wrap up our very cheap summer of Roger Corman by watching two of his most uh, discussed films, Rock and Roll High School from 1979 and the unreleased Fantastic Four movie from 1994. Funny, give me yes. some dramatic music. Dun, 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 dun. So this is the last episode of our last theme, Summer 2024, the very cheap summer of Roger Corman. The legendary filmmaker best known for making cheap films under budget. I, I, I came to Barry Corman not to praise him. I'm, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan. Um, I, I kind of wish we did Rocky again. That's yeah. how much I love Roger Corman. Although it is nice seeing Dick Miller every once in a while. Yes, it is. So we uh, get a okay. chance to get a little Dick in a movie. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So the first film was Rock and Roll High School. Bonnie, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care if I lose street cred or if people think this isn't cool. I believe this is the second time I've ever seen this. Yeah, might have seen uh, it a couple of times more than that. Yeah, I I think this was the second time seeing it. I I I never cared for it. But then again, I'm the wrong age. I was in high school in the nineties. If I was in high school in the in the early eighties, then this might be the shit for me. 
but it's not. No, this, okay, I enjoy this movie. This is a bad movie. There you go. This is a bad movie that picks up extra credit points for odd little things, including now nostalgia. You know, seeing PJ Souls in something again. Fucking love that woman. I'm going to give it an, an additional two points just for her. Hell yeah, I fucking love her. There was a band in Sacramento, a short-lived all-girl band in Sacramento called the Rip Randalls. Yeah. Uh, plus, how do I say this nicely? I love the Ramones in my teens and 20s. Now, I'm less angry, I have a lot less cartilage, and I don't particularly care for the music of the Ramones. As much as I used Fuck to you in too. my youth. Fuck you too. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just older. And just, I had a phase in my teens and 20s, but I, I'm, I'm not that anymore. I love PJ Souls. She is fucking gorgeous. And then here's another... Uh, one of those tropes, PJ Souls and her best friend, the ugly nerd. I say ugly because she's wearing glasses. Yes. So she'll always be an ugly nerd. Yes. I mean, it's not like she's going to take off her glasses and suddenly be a completely different person. That never happens in movies. No, not at all. Um, Colleen Howard, get a couple of points. Well, I got to give a point to the Ramones. It, you, this you, is the you most be hair like I've that ever if seen. you have to be. But yeah, this is the most hair I've ever seeing, seen on Clint Howard. For seeing Clint Howard? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and for me, I don't know. I always feel a little happy whenever I see the Bartels in a movie. The Bartels. One thing that, that killed me is that Riff Randall is saying, oh, man, I want to write a song for the Ramones. And it's like, I don't think it would be this difficult because fucking the Ramones never wanted to write music for the Ramones. No. So I honestly don't think it would be as hard as it is in this movie. And like, do you, what? Do you have to come up with like, Three lines? Like, max? Yeah. For a oh, and then, song? Apparently, Dee Dee was such a fucking shitty actor that, he, that they bumped him from seven lines down to two. Oh, wow. So, haha. And I said this earlier on the first half of the podcast, I'm surprised that the Ramones were able to fit this in during their busy schedule of overdoses. It was well, nice of them to schedule that. When did they become, like, more mainstream? Not here. Because you know I literally I mean? did look up, like, a fun fact where, like, they were only getting paid $250,000 to be in this movie, and so they had to keep doing concerts at night while they filmed during the day so that they could afford to even make the movie. That, and al- that, that and makes also, sense out of Roger Corman. Yeah, and also, uh, yeah, D.D. Ramon did overdose during the making of this film. Oh, yeah? So, awesome. Yeah. So it was still during that period. There was some weird stuff about this that I like. Um, number one, Dick Watch. Anytime you get to see Dick Miller in a movie, yes, yeah. it love it. It's great, and also you, they did a good job drawing him in the poster. Yeah, really like the poster. One of those wet hot American summer posters where it's all like a caricature you get on the beach. But the overall look of the movie. 
and I'm putting this in the plus column too. The overall look of the movie looks like a 60, 65 year old guy's interpretation of what they think high school looks like now. Yeah, I saw this film as just a 1979 punk rock beach film. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's just you get uh, Riff Randall and the chick away, and you could easily just put fucking Frankie and Annette in here. Yeah, there's like real no no real story here. Yeah, anything anything that's not you you've seen a hundred times. But seriously, we're, Mary we're gonna Warnoff be- knew everything that was going on in that school. She didn't know Clint Howard was pimping out of the bathroom. Yeah, that's weird. That is weird. But let me. But everybody okay, else so, knew he was there. Everybody, everybody else knew he was there. I think that when a band gets so popular, they should be allowed one teeny bop beach movie. I could see an alternate universe where Nirvana got a beach film. I I could go with that. I I would be very curious. And it's like, then there are bands that I hate, but like, fuck, I would watch the Imagine Dragons beach movie. Yeah. I would see that. That would be fun. These kids are just really happy to be in the background, but not only are we streaming this to an audience of three, but also this is a podcast, so you're only appearing in like 50% of the podcast because you're being seen. You're not being heard, kids. So before the Ramones signed on, fans and or musicians considered for the starring part of this movie included and these are all horrible ideas, Cheap Trick. Okay. Uh, no. Todd Rundgren. Maybe they would have changed it to I don't want to go to school. I just want to bang on a drum all day. Yeah. Devo. Ugh. And Fucking Van Halen. Okay. And to be clear, I think Van I think uh, 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 Van Halen should get a movie. It should be David Lee Roth, Van Halen, and they don't get a beach movie. They get a Scooby Doo esque mystery. Okay, I can live with that. Yeah, that I can see. But see, see the but even then, I mean, again, this movie's. 1977, Van Halen would have been fairly well unknown at this point still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think that as much as I might not like the music of the Ramones, they are one of my favorite cover bands. Yeah. Like, their original music, it's okay, but, but like, in my mind, the Ramones own the song California Song, because that's the version that I'm not embarrassed to listen to. Okay. And, uh, there are some other covers that they do that I really like. Uh... Oh, and they also recorded the uh, 1960s Spider-Man theme song. And yes, I really like that. I really like that. Oh, and for a while, Maxwell really liked the song um, I Don't Want to Grow Up when he was younger. Yeah. I don't want to grow up. I don't think you remember that, Maxwell, but you did. You, you Huge Ramones fan. Um. And also, the DJ screaming Steve Stevens is actually 
L.A. DJ, the real Don Steele, who was 93 uh, And K-H-K. two points for him being in it. Yeah. Uh, to be he is clear, such a weird character, and this is the same exact fucking guy from Death Race. And... Humanoids from the Deep, I think. Yeah. And... Uh, once upon a time, dot, 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 in Hollywood. Really? Yeah. Uh, 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 the real Don Steele, 93 KHJ, 317 at KHJ. Oh, he was on the car radio? Intense. That's me, the real Don Steele, Simon and Garfunkeling, Mrs. Robinson. He's like the DJ that they listen to the most in the car when they're driving and is all over the soundtrack. Cool. Yeah. It like I have I have recently caught Maxwell singing, not singing the song Mrs. Robinson, but singing the DJ parts before Mrs. Robinson in the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood soundtrack. <laughs> the real Don Steele, 93 KHJ. Yeah. So we're big real Don Steele fans at, in this house. Yeah. Yeah. So, buddy, why don't you hit us with the plot? The intricate Tolkien-esque plot of rock and roll high school. Uh, well, there's a high school. It has mm-hmm. a mean principal. Uh, um, the popular girl is a big Ramones fan. She buys everybody and- tickets. The Ramones show up, and uh, they win. And then, and then the the like rebellious popular cheerleader or wild girl. Is best friends with the nerdiest girl in class? Yeah. That part I had a problem with. There that is was no weird. real plot here. There are just brushes with plot. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That I'm okay with. That's a good way to describe it. How did... Um... Roger Corman transitioned from Ron Howard to Clint Howard. That's Clint, a question Clint that works I have. Real, you know Clint works real fucking cheap. Oh, you that's know. exactly it. I didn't think about that. Eventually, Opie Cunningham just became too expensive to afford. Yeah. There you go. I get that. I'm fine with that. So, uh, Dick Watch, Dick Miller's in this. He's a cop. This movie is a product of its time. It's a modern day beach movie. There are numerous bands that I hate, but oh my gosh, um, Metallica gets sent free, all expense paid trip to a mysterious island for a vacation. And oh my god, they get wrapped in a plot of intrigue? Yeah. I would go and see that. Uh, uh, Metallica's Caribbean Beach Adventure. I'd okay. pay good money to see that. that good damn fun. money. Yeah. So the second film is the unreleased 1994 Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie. I swear we we did an episode about this, but I searched and it wasn't a movie we did. So then I thought maybe we've covered it as a historic approximations, but I didn't find it there either. But I yeah. swear we have discussed this film in some capacity. Well, probably when we did the other Fantastic Four. Yeah, maybe. I, I, but I distinctly remember us having a lengthy conversation of the fact that the first Johnny Storm in movies also played 
in the Computer War Tennis Shoes Disney movie series starring the dad from Growing Pains. Really? Yes. That was like a Disney kid actor that ended up being cast as Johnny Storm. And he is one of he his portrayal of Johnny Storm is the only portrayal of Johnny Storm that I that I like he nailed it in yeah. the sense that I fucking hate his guts. Yeah. Because he's annoying as fuck, like Johnny Storm should be. Yeah. I like Chris Chris Evans. Chris Evans is a Johnny Storm, but he's cool. I want to hang out with him. Johnny Storm should be someone you want to slap. At least that's the way that I see it. But um, this is one of four Fantastic Four movies made. And I would just like to take this time, since we are a podcast, to say uh, I would like to put them in order. I have made a list of my top five favorite Fantastic Four movies. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Last on the list is uh, uh, 2015's Fantastic Four. Okay. I kind of like Michael B. Jordan as uh, Johnny Storm, but like I, it, the rest of the movie, it sucks. And also, you really fuck Doctor Doom uh, again. Like, Doctor Doom is an integral character that needs to be a part of this, and it, the only movie that has gotten it right is the movie we're discussing this week, which is number four on my list, yes. the unreleased Fantastic Four movie from 1994. This is a perfect fucking Doctor Doom. Yes. <laughs> the one thing they really nailed. This is exactly how he looks. And then, oh, hey, they're making this big budget Fantastic Four movie. In uh, you know, with Jessica Alba and that guy from the Shield, and uh, that Doctor Doom sucked ass. Oh God, yes. So uh, number three is uh, actually no, number five is that Fantastic Four, the first Fantastic Four with Michael Chiklis. Number four is the Fantastic Four from 2015 with Michael B. Jordan. Number three on my list is Fantastic Four Rise of Silver Surfer. They did a really good job of making uh, the Silver Surfer as a character. That I like. Number two is the Fantastic Four movie from 1994, the unreleased one that we're discussing right now. And the number one best Fantastic Four movie of all time is the Disney Pixar animated film The Incredibles from 2004, <laughs> and no one can change my mind about that. <laughs> so far, it is the best Fantastic Four movie to ever come out. Just like the best Star Trek movie is uh, that Tim Allen film. Yeah. Galaxy Quest. That's the best Star Trek movie. I, I really do feel, though, that picking on this movie is just like kicking a puppy. Yeah. They tried yeah. the best they could being With as nothing. set up for failure as possible. Yeah. And these people have, having been lied to, believing that they were going to be in this huge blockbuster Fantastic Four movie. You know, well, it was it was 1994 and it was a long time ago. It was a different time in Hollywood. And so this film was made quickly and cheaply in a desperate attempt to keep uh, the film rights to the Fantastic Four characters, because when Marvel was giving out all of these different rights to all of these different part, uh, comic book characters, the rule was that you had to keep having a movie in development during a period in time. And so this movie had to be made and made cheaply and quickly just so that the person who owned the rights could keep them. But that was a long time ago. There is no way. It, we, the Hollywood has improved so much since then that no longer do studios have to throw together a Everyone. shitty film 
10 minute warning. No longer do Hollywood studios have to uh, throw together a badly made cheap film in order to save uh, movie rights for a specific character or franchise. And in totally unrelated news, did you see there's a new Craven the Hunter trailer? <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah, I wonder if it's going to be as good as Madame Web. But, oh, oh, you know, yeah. I, fingers crossed. I, I, I saw Madam Webb as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I feel that Madam Webb would have been a successful film if it was released right out there with Electra and uh, Blade Trinity. Yeah. That period of movies. But releasing it now, it's fucking dumb. Um, there's a lot they, wrong with this it's film. It's just so sad that they really, really want to get their own Marvel Spider-Verse going, and they are doing so fucking bad. So horrible. So absolutely horrible. Um, yes, there's a lot wrong with this movie, and there's zero budget and the special effects are shit and it was made quickly and on the cheap solely to keep the film rights but um, the script is horrible but you know what? You go back and you read those first ten Fantastic Four comic books yeah. this it, the Fantastic Four started out cheesy as fuck so in that sense this movie is fucking perfectly on point Also, this is the absolute best comic accurate Doctor Doom. And what with the MCU currently set to make Tony Stark Doctor Doom, this 1994 unreleased Fantastic Four movie may still be the best Doctor Doom. So that's exciting. And also... I like the fact that Ben Grimm is just a guy in a suit. Practical effects. I like practical effects. Um, the edibles have kicked... What? It's not that bad looking of a suit. Yeah, yeah, it's not that bad looking of a suit. And they really fucked up uh, the Mole Man, but that's beside the point. I think that that's a nigh on filmable character. The Mole Man. But he, they, was, they, he was fun in a very kind of offbeat kind of way. Very much so, yeah. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that kills me about this movie. It, this was made in 1994. Yeah. It looks like it was made uh by Superstation TBS in 1983. I know that oh, they have. No, like... I disagree. Some of those effects were really pretty good, considering. We have to put a big fucking considering on okay. this whole yes. movie. Yes, but here are the other movies released in 1994 Pulp Fiction, The Shawshank Redemption, uh, Wagons East, all classics. Okay. Uh, Ed Wood, The Lion King, all oh, classics. Um, Squanto, an Indian's Tale, all oh, classics of yeah. cinema. And but this just looks horrible. I even found like a like a ten eighty whatever the fuck K super high definition restoration, and it still looks like. This was made in the 80s, around the same time as that shitty Captain America. But this is a decade after that. But it does not look like this was released around about the same time as Johnny Mnemonic and Interview with the Vampire. But there's only so good you're going to do when you're trying to barter using Pop-Tarts for yes. currency. You know? Yeah. So, what considering your... that, 
the lightning effects were really pretty good. I didn't mind uh, Johnny Storm's completely animated. hand-drawn animated climax. Yeah. Bunny, what, what are your what are your thoughts about the upcoming Fantastic Four movie? <sighs> it's Marvel. I'm keeping reserve. I, I, I've been hurt too many times now. There's one thing that has never been in the comic books, but I like the fact that they are putting it in this movie because it makes it it makes the origin make more sense. Um, Reed Richards is a is a an award winning scientist who also has a TV show for kids. Yeah, and now it's time for Fantastic Science with your host. Mr. Fantastic! And it's like, okay, that's better than the way it's supposed to be in the comic. Yeah. It, Reed Richards is less of an asshole now. So I like that. Oh, and Galactus is going to be a man in a helmet and not like a fucking ball of gas. So that's another yeah. positive. Yeah. So anyway, that's it for this week. Uh, rock and Roll High School, fine. Fantastic Four <coughs> is pretty good for what they had, which was nothing. It's pretty good. Yeah. For a movie yeah. that nobody loved. Yes. It's pretty for, good. For a movie that wasn't even to cash in. You know, a it movie, was just made a movie just, that was made for legal reasons. Legal expedience, that is it. Yeah, this is the film version of Rolling Stones last uh, Rolling Stones single Cocksucker Blues. Yes. Monty Python's contractually obligated album. <laughs> 1994's Fantastic Four. So that's this week. Next week, uh, it, we're wrapping up the podcast. I am going to be doing the next two episodes, and then it's all, all bunny until we finish it out. And so, uh, I was originally going to show movies we've watched before, and we go back and we watch them again. Fuck that. Next week, we're watching I Saw the TV Glow. I Saw it's the an, TV Glow. Yes, it's an A24 um horror film that apparently I need to watch because uh, of who I am. Okay. So we're watching that. Check the cough cough. It's there. And that's going to be a lot of fun next week. But now that I'm looking back at this week, the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs, the real Don Steele and the Ramones and Trap and Roger Corman, I've got to say, I think this has been a pretty darn good episode. A pretty... It's been... A, it's been a it's been an all right a, a fine <laughs> episode of the Pope on film. It has been a damn good episode. Yes. Okay. I I I tried I realized I said it was a damn good episode and then I walked it back because I feel like you're the person who makes that <laughs> distinction, not me. But anyway, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week. I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend May Lynn. And uh, wait, what was the dick watch count? Uh, dick Miller was in Rock and Roll High School. He was not in the Fantastic Four. I think he might have actually been the person in the, the thing suit. But yeah. we have no proof of that. Um, we will see you. Um, thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you real Don Steele, 93 KHK. Good job, Maxwell. Do 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 do